What's cracking guys, Sammy x 7 here throwing at you my One Piece 1054 initial thoughts and whatnots. First of all, spoilers, obviously. Second, I regret to inform you that I think One Piece may actually be coming to an end. This chapter had to be a banger, being our return to serialization after over a month away from new One Piece. But it banged too hard. <sighs> Oda dropped too many bombs, and with every passing moment, new ideas are rushing me like, what if Vivi's on Wano, and is Jewelry Bonnie now among the revolutionaries? So let's dive right in with my out of order review. Point of emphasis 1. What happened in the Holy Land? The cat's finally out of the bag, and the first round of theorizing has come to a close. The news shared with the world regarding Sabo has been revealed, and the public story, as many of us already believed, is that Sabo has killed Nefertari Cobra. <sighs> okay, um, let's just run through all the information we have. Sambo has allegedly killed Cobra, Vivi is currently missing, the Alabaster ship has yet to set out, Sabo and the Revolutionary Army commanders freed Kuma following a fight against Admirals Fujitora and Ryokugyu, and at some point they destroyed a monument that stands as the symbol of the world nobles. Okay. Now, as a result of all of this, Sabo's become a hero of the people for taking the fight to the oppressive oligarchs that have made the world theirs and theirs alone. This has gone so far that they've dubbed him the Flame Emperor. Emperor. Oda knows what he's doing, that choice of words just after the instatement of two new Yonko and a color cover involving them is no mere coincidence. Something's up, and I want you to hear me out. The Gorosei wanted this. The Revolutionary Army, their greatest and only direct adversary, walked into their home and shamed them. People roamed the streets around the globe, singing their praises and professing adoration of the man who feared not to take the life of a direct descendant of the original 20 kings. This was all according to their plan, and here's how I think things shook down. We have our secret supreme overlord, Im Sama, an ill aging king whose curiosity has made him a nuisance. His daughter, the overlord, seems to have some form of interest in, and a group of rebels the world believes will go to any length to topple the government. Those are our four persons of interest. Or, well, three persons and an army? Then again, they do use Sabo to represent the revolutionaries here, so back to four... Semantics. That's unimportant. With the meddling of our ailing King Cobra becoming troublesome for the Gorosei, and likely Ima, as would be determined by any good authoritarian leadership, that is grounds for him to be disposed of. The question then becomes, however, how do we go about doing so and what explanation are we to give for it? Hmm, if only there were some terrorists who might conveniently appear and cause a major event in which he might be collateral. Oh wait, see where I'm going with this? Using the number two of the Revolutionary Army as a scapegoat allows them to rid themselves of the problem while drawing neither suspicion nor attention. But Sam, why can't we just believe what the papers said? Oda wouldn't have Sabo kill the father of one of Luffy's Nakama, and quite frankly, he'd have no reason to do so. If it was simply for the fame as was suggested in the chapter, while the Revolutionary Army was running rampant burning homes in the Holy Land, they could have directly gone after genuine world nobles. If your reason instead is that it would incite rebellion in Alabasta, we need then to look at how the Revs have done things thus far. 
They never go after the rulers directly. They inspire the people to do it for themselves, as is the case with the eight kingdoms that revolted against the leadership of their monarchs who attended the reverie. Now that we can assume Sabo's innocent, the next question, where's Vivi? Going by my previous logic, I believe that if her disappearance was the result of her capture by the Gorosei to be given to Im, they would have covered the story up similarly, i.e. by blaming it on the revolutionary army. Seeing as they did not do so, I don't think they actually know where she ended up. You might wonder, why not then just blame it on them anyway? They already have a list of crimes attributed to them. Well, my dear viewer, that's what anyone reading the paper would assume, anyway. And it allows the government to evade culpability should she return to the public, since that would damage their credibility and lead to people wondering if they'd been dishonest about Cobra as well. Now, this doesn't actually address the matter of her whereabouts. Allow me to paint a picture for you. Sabo and his goons have just managed to wrestle Kuma from his captors. They seek now to make their grand escape and flee the scene. To do so, they must get away from Fuji and Green Bull who have been engaging them in the domain of the gods. That's their fancy name for where their houses are. The gang manages to exit and seeks out a quiet place where the wounded Kuma can use his ability to facilitate their exit. The quiet and deserted place, however, just so happens to be the site of Cobra's assassination, where his killers may still remain. Possibly with Vivi either captured or mounting a futile resistance. Seeing this, the hero that Sabo is prevents him from leaving the poor girl be. He fights the assassins, holds them off for long enough that Kuma can get everybody else out, including Vivi. These were just a random set of circumstances that were neither impossible nor terribly likely. But what this all hinges on is a run-in between her and the revolutionaries, no matter how it happens. Continuing on with my hypothetical, I see one of two possible scenarios unfolding once Vivi's within the reach of Kuma's paws. Either A, he sends her to the same location as everyone else, or B, he sends her where she would be safest. For the second option, there are plenty of suitable destinations, but with her father having just been killed, she'd want to be in the presence of the people she knows she can most trust to safeguard her life without endangering anyone. The Straw Hats this option involves someone having knowledge of their being in Wano, but that's not terribly far-fetched for the revolutionary army considering the number of spies different groups have been shown to have in the country. Now, this is the part where you might ask, If she's in Wano, where has she been up until now? And the answer to that is simple. She was lost. Not necessarily in a Zoro sense, but by virtue of not knowing where to go to find the Straw Hats. Leading up to the raid, they had been planning a secret operation, which all happened to take place in one night in a secluded setting. Even after this, the story shared with the countrymen was that Joy Boy had been the one to defeat Kaido and end his reign of terror. The Straw Hats have only just now made their first public appearance, so it wouldn't be hard to believe that Vivi could have been there the entire time unbeknownst to anyone. That's all conjecture though, so let's forget that tangent and take a step back. I won't go into the details of what this might mean for Jewelry Bonnie's character going forward, because I'm still on the first point of emphasis and I've been talking for way longer than I'd anticipated. But the last time we saw her, she had entered the domain of the gods to free Kuma after attending the reverie as the queen dowager of the Sorbet Kingdom. If he was freed, her business there would be complete. But I'd have a hard time believing she did all of that just to let someone else make off with him. 
If she wasn't already with the revolutionaries, I believe she is now. Her devil fruit would be massively useful for the army considering how it could allow the prominent members to go unnoticed in public, so they definitely wouldn't put up much resistance to her coming along. If anything, with Kuma being worn down, she could have provided an alternative means of escape. And I'm realizing I started going off topic again. You, you know what, I'll just make videos about anything I have a particularly strong desire to talk about in great depth. I'll cut to the chase now. Although this was far from ideal, why would the Gorosei play into this? Censoring the happenings within Marijua shouldn't have been hard, and allowing Sabo to amass such a following by making him out to be a Machiavellian schemer has only called the masses to stand against them in support of the Flame Emperor. So in what good way could this help them? It gives them an excuse for the next great cleansing. How better could the government get away with mass genocide than under the guise of fighting a war another man started? Point of Emphasis 2. What is happening in Wano? Let me be clear, I'm not referring to the surrounding seas quite yet. That'll be Point of Emphasis 3, as those of you who've looked at the cards may have gleamed. Last chapter, we had the reveal of Green Bull as he marched towards the flower capital to claim Luffy's head, and this picks up right from there. I don't have an awful lot to say about this section of the chapter, most of it was pretty straightforward, but there were some things that caught my attention. The premiere of which was the reveal of Aramaki's devil fruit. The Logia type, forest forest fruit. Oda, why? I feel like there were other ways you could have handled this. I'm not a botanist. Especially not one that focuses on the classification of devil fruits. But couldn't you have just made it a paramecia? Maybe a special paramecia? I suppose after seeing how he fights and uses it, I can understand that he has an invulnerable form similar to Aokiji's. Fair. But I feel like it might have so much more utility than a regular Logia that it becomes unusual. I'll make a video on this guy later, maybe, especially since this chapter also reveals to us the inner machinations of his brain. He believes in order and is the admiral that poses an absolute that pins him at the far extreme of the axis even a Kainu doesn't touch. Those who don't fall in line or submit are all enemies in some capacity. This would be the perfect opportunity to get distracted and go into how this makes me feel about him and whatnot, or maybe discuss the theory suggesting he's a celestial dragon and prospective Gorose successor, citing his likeness to Don Quixote Miosgard, who featured in this chapter, but I'll leave that for another day in favor of discussing the skirmishes were given. First, all of the scabbards are heavily wounded from the battle on Onigashima, so it's not unthinkable that a green bull who just sucked a bunch of beast pirate remnants dry would be able to contend with them. Though I'm not sure he'd really win if this did come down to an all-out battle between the two parties, if he was able to whittle down their numbers before taking serious damage, he'd be the favorite. Second, Yamato's entrance worries me. He announced himself as Kaido's son and told off Aramaki for trying to rob Wano of its freedom after only just having had it returned to them. Nothing here is wrong, and none of it should raise a red flag, but together they do. Yamato sounds awfully distant from the Straw Hats and almost seems like he feels personally responsible for protecting the happiness of this country. You might argue that this is because it's the freedom that the Straw Hats fought to win, but I think he might just be feeling guilty. Of course, none of what happened was his fault but that might just make it worse. As someone who faced captivity like the rest of Wanokuni, 
Yamato might have reservations about leaving and may decide to abandon his dreams of setting sail with the crew to remain behind and defend the country from invaders. I really hope this doesn't turn out to be the case, and Oda knows how popular Yamato is, so I doubt he'd tease us so heavily just to break our hearts, but the seeds of doubt have been sown and cannot be ignored. Third, Momo has decided to fight Green Bull alone. I like this. I'm certain he's going to lose, but I like this. Not just because it's character development for Momo, I honestly couldn't care, but because it pushes my agenda that he's stronger than Kaido. Sadly, however, since I already have a video on that up, I'll have to focus on the character development. As Shogun, he's finally decided to take the defense of his country into his own hands. He wants to be a leader that inspires faith in his people, not one that can't accomplish anything with his own strength. This determination to stop being cowardly and work towards doing things for himself is likely Oda's way of wrapping up his character arc before we can leave Wano. And it might double as a way of soothing Yamato's heart, convincing him that he can set sail and truly live out his life freely, which I beg is the route we end up following. And at last, point of emphasis 3. Shanks. This was easily the part of chapter 1054 which excited me the most, but also saddened me the deepest. I am pretty sure this might be the most Shanks has been in a single chapter since chapter 1 in 1997. Let that sink in. If Oda is ready to make him an actual character and part of the story, it means he's ready to bring it to a close. Shanks was on Roger's crew and has already unraveled many of the world's mysteries, which has made it very difficult to give him any major part in the story while maintaining his secrets. I mean, Oda said it himself. He's finally ready to stop walking on eggshells and let it all out. After Momo engages Green Bull, we cut to the seas outside Wano where we find the Red Force. The Red Hair Pirates are reacting to the official appointment of Luffy as one of the Emperors. I read the chapter. If you've watched this far, I'm going to assume you read the chapter too. I'm not going to narrate the specifics of what happened and start fanboying. We all did that on our Discord servers already, just like Shanks' cabin boys. Instead, I want to talk about what really stood out. Beck. Shanks has a nickname for Ben Beckman. This is the biggest news we've gotten in a while, and it's all cute and fuzzy. Truth be told, I got so confused trying to figure out what was going on when he said that name. I racked my brain trying to remember the film red characters we've already gotten the names of and figure out who this could be. Until I continued reading, saw Ben Beckman and facepalmed. Okay, I said I'd stick to what was important. I'm sorry. Because of the disrespect Shanks received from the Barto Club, he says that he isn't coming to Wano for a reunion with Luffy, as that would be the wrong way for a Yonko to behave. There are two ways to interpret this. Either A. He has no intention of meeting Luffy, and has other business to attend to, or B, he plans on meeting Luffy, but not so they can party. The wording of the translation makes the second interpretation improbable, but not impossible. Shanks could be here to face Luffy Yonko to Yonko. If so, they aren't fighting seriously, they're boys. But the classic sky-splitting exchange to test out Luffy's hockey could suffice for Shanks to maintain his honor, after which he could get down to his real business, the reason he came to Wano. The One Piece. Shanks said it's time to claim it, so it's time to claim it. And there are a million theories about what this entails, but we can't forget about the reveal from chapter 1053, even if it was over a month ago. Pluton is in Wano, and this might be the part of the One Piece Big Mom asked Kaido about. 
If Shanks has known about Pluton this whole time, why would he wait until now to claim it and set off for the One Piece? Well, among our options, the most obvious would be Kaido. Although Shanks might have had the means to fight Kaido, it certainly wouldn't have been without losses, especially if he intended to make off with what has been described so far to be a massive battleship. Revealing the location of Pluton would have done far more harm than good to his plans because it would open him up to attacks from the other three emperors. With Luffy having defeated Kaido, however, operations within Wano have become far more straightforward, and the risk of attack by other emperors has greatly diminished with Luffy and Buggy posing no threat to him. Something Teking believes was by Shanks' design, proposing that Buggy was the pirate Shanks spoke to the Gorosei about in order to elect an emperor he knew he'd never have to worry about. But I digress. I could go further into detail, but you should get the idea about why Kaido's downfall makes for the perfect timing. What if that's not it, though? What if that was just a happy accident? I think the precursor for Shanks taking action was Luffy finally devil fruit. If Shanks went through the trouble of fighting CP9 and attacking a world government ship to get his hands on that fruit, he certainly knew what it was. And whether he intended to eat and awaken it himself, or was on Don Island to find Ace and give it to his former captain's son, the fruit was certainly an integral part of his plan. Perhaps for the connection Joy Boy has to Poseidon, or some other endgame entity. Specifics aside, we may get into those someday, I believe Luffy's awakening is what spurred Shanks to begin moving again after his years of constant partying. And I think we've got a lot of peak peace coming up. Um, I think that's it. I obviously couldn't give my two cents on every single panel of the chapter because that'd make for a video even longer than this has already turned out to be, but I appreciate you sticking through this far. To structure my videos and try keep them from going on for too long, I've decided that my chapter views will henceforth only have three major points of emphasis, though my tangents may lead us into a few other things here and there. This video is already pretty long and I haven't edited anything yet, which I imagine will take time. So I'm not sure how quickly I'll be able to get it out, but if you like my videos and want to help me upload more frequently and consistently, please consider supporting me over on Patreon. It would really help me out. If you aren't in a position to do so, however, you can subscribe to the channel, like this video, and share it with friends. Thanks for watching, guys. Until next time, this has been SamuX607, logging out.